Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Devin. I'm Cliff Gooding. I'm a grateful alcoholic. I'm sober since August the 15th of 2001, and for that short amount of time, I'm as grateful as I know how to be. And uh, I want to say a special thanks to the committee for asking me to come and actually do the first one. It's a, it's an honor and privilege to be thought of, and, and especially to be asked to do something. And this is a, it's a great uh, 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 thing to work towards and having the uh, uh, Fellowship of the Spirit Conference, hopefully live, Donna, in 2022. And my wife, Devin, had asked my wife. She actually participated last year in the Fellowship of the Spirit uh, Conference that they had uh, uh, virtual out of New York last year. And and Devin had called her at, up, and she spoke uh, uh, on one of the panels uh, for the al family group. And uh, I'm excited to be a part of this and excited for what's happening for us in 2022. And uh, I want to say hello to my friends, a lot of my friends that are here tonight. It's good to see them. Brad from Oklahoma is here, just so that you all know there's more than one uh, recovered alcoholic in Oklahoma. Brad is here, and that's good. Uh, Flying the flag from Oklahoma as well. So <clears throat> it's good to be here. Some things I've learned about in this uh, odd time of uh, uh, COVID-19 and, and when we're all kind of this lockdown here, I never was much of a 13th stepper, but I've kind of become a 14th stepper. I like to watch and I don't know about you, but I just kind of scroll through the videos. If you're sitting at home thinking, are they looking at me? Hell yes. Just know right now that we're looking at you, man. We're scrolling through. We're checking you out. There's no doubt about that, man. But this is one of the best looking bunch of sick people I've seen gathered up in a while. So it's good to be with you tonight. And, uh, to talk and share a little bit with you about uh, uh, willfulness and willingness. When uh, when they called me and asked me about this, uh, to do this, they said, well, pick a topic. And, you know, that's like a shotgun for somebody like me. I mean, I need a little help. I'm like a squirrel in a cage. You give me that much latitude. And, and uh, so I just sat and prayed about it for a day or two and wrote back and said, hey, how about this? And, uh, so we'll just kind of see where it goes. I have no, I have nothing, uh, nothing really planned out. We'll just see if God can help us get it all gathered up in one spot or not. And uh, my experience is, is generally he, he, he somehow finds our way home. And so when I think about, uh, you know, willfulness and willingness, it's really a bit of a transition from where we are prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous and what it takes for us to stay here in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, when we, when we relate our stories of uh, what we were like, we're really telling you about the willfulness of our life. Our book tells us that selfishness and self-centered, this is the root of our problem. And so when we describe to people what we were like, we're really telling them, and we circle around talking about alcoholism as it has affected us and our drinking because it's so important to identify and have identification. But we all know that once you get here and you've been here a while, they spring it on you. You know, you, everybody in my life prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous told me the same thing. You've got a drinking problem. I came to AA in about 30 days. Somebody said, you don't have a drinking problem. And, you know, if you're new or you're nearly new, please don't run home uh, uh, after this meeting and tell whoever, hey, that goofball from New York said I don't have a drinking problem. They'll hunt me down, man. Don't do that. You know, just let them live in the delusion that they've created for themselves. Because it certainly is, and we certainly do have a drinking problem. But that's not the real problem. And the book tells us that early on, you know, it just tells bottoms were a symbol. There's something, there's something else about us. That's why the book, after a certain point, it just quits talking about drinking altogether. Because we've discovered that drinking is certainly the admission ticket here. It certainly is what gets us in the door. It's certainly what propels us here. And we know if we fail to follow spiritual principles, that's what's waiting for us again. There's no doubt about that. But when we talk about what we were like, the thread that's common and runs through all of our stories after the, the allergic reaction that we get, which Silkworth says was the commonality of all alcoholics, is that once we start drinking, 
something different happens to us than 90% of the population. Doesn't happen to the average temperate drinker. Certainly that thread is what we have in common. But woven in all of our stories is certainly the thread of willfulness as it winds its way through our life. As it winds its way through where how we end up in a place like this. You know, how do we work our way all the way to Alcoholics Anonymous? You know, always like to tell new people, if you're new or you're nearly new here tonight, a couple of things. One of them is welcome. Because you're wanted, welcome, and needed in Alcoholics Anonymous. Absolutely. If you don't hear anything else, please hear that. But the second thing is that if you made it to Alcoholics Anonymous, we don't have any place to refer you down to. I mean, if you're here, then you're just here with us. And, and we're glad you're here with us. Uh, uh, and the people here, the good news is the people here are going to be your new best friends. You know, 30 years ago, it seems like when we were doing in-person meetings, you know, we could actually circulate around but, but that common theme of selfishness, that willfulness spreads across our stories. It's, it's the great mosaic that we paint of our willfulness. And the greatest, you know, the greatest uh, 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 look at willfulness, the big book tells us, is uh, we're, we're people who are self-will run riot. The extreme example and uh, and then the book, the book talks about, you know, we talk about what we were like and then what happens. Those are the circumstances. Circumstances of our lives, they don't necessarily always have to be physical circumstances. We think sometimes of, of uh, physical circumstances, certainly uh, uh, being arrested or something like that. But spiritual circumstances oftentimes govern changes in our life. But this idea of, you know, what we were like, what happened, the circumstances. And the circumstances is my experience of what propel us to make this transition from willfulness to willingness. Initially, the initial trans transformation from that obstinacy that we have, you know. And the best description is when you come to Alcoholics Anonymous, I, mean, I don't know about you, but when I looked at the steps on the wall, I just knew that wasn't going to work. I mean, I got here, I had real world problems. I mean, I didn't have problems that those didn't look like those were the answer. I mean, I'm a lawyer by trade. And when I began to look at the steps, I got down to step four and they talked about writing stuff down. Well, that's evidence. We, we just don't do that. We don't write anything down. And then they talked about telling somebody about it. Well, you all know that snitches get stitches. We're not telling anybody nothing, right? We're just not giving it up. You know, and then they want us to make amends. So on any given day, those do not look attractive. And when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had been unemployed for three years. My wife had kicked me out of my house. I had not worked. I was unemployed, unemployable. I didn't have any money in the bank. I was sad, sick, and sorry when I washed up here. And I'll look at those steps and say, eh, the, I've got real world problems. Those are probably good for people who are here just before they go to India to help minister to the poor. But I've got real world problems. Now, my sponsor, who was so kind to me, not really, who was so kind to me, uh, would look at me and say things like, Cliff, you don't have problems. And I would say to him, these are problems, man. These are real life problems. Unemployed, unemployed. I'd go through the list again. He said, those are not problems. Those are consequences of actions based on self. Now, listen, that doesn't sound to have a lot of sex appeal to me to go up and tell people, listen, do you want to hear about my consequences based on self? I, that, that just doesn't have any kick to it. You know, I want to tell you about my problems, because if I tell you about my problems, you know, I'm the victim. I can tell you what they did to me. And then it becomes, you know, it's their fault. And as long as it's their fault, I don't have to deal with it. But if I have to talk about consequences based on self, then those are my those are my doings. And when I have to look at me, I deflect. And so, you know, the book is a great teacher for us. There's like eight or nine times the big book talks about willingness. It leads us through, but it gives us, it all, besides willingness, it'll talk about willing, being willing to do certain things. So how do we move? How do we get, what, what does that look like? What does that willfulness look like for us? You know, how is it? that we get ourselves in this jam. How is it that I get myself in a jam where I need some kind of 
transformation, that I got to have some kind of collaboration with a power greater than me. I mean, how does that happen to a nice guy like me, a nice girl like Caroline? How does that happen to nice people like us? I mean, how do we find ourselves in these genes? And, I, and if we go back through our history, we just kind of go back in our own lives. We begin to look at our experience. We look at what has happened to us. You know, it's the first thing we talk about. It's the coin of the realm here. Our experience, and, and uh, Henry Ford is quoted in, our, in, the, in the chapter to wives, I believe, or the family after, talks about the key things that most families have and nothing else is our experience. The ability to share that with some other family, it says for them to avert death and misery. And so we trade on that here. We trade on our experiences. That's what that's what hooked me. Somebody sharing their experience with me hooked me into Alcoholics Anonymous. And so to look at this idea of willingness, what is willfulness, where does it come from? What's it what's it manifested in? And how do I get in this jam to get here? You know, I'm a kid that if you look, if I look back on my life and I have some, if I have some uh, uh, inventory and I look about my life and really give it a good, a good once over, I'm a kid that from the very get go, when I was, uh, you know, in the kindergarten, I would, when I remember when my mama spit shined me up and had me there early for class, I remember walking in and thinking I'm behind. You know, I'm there early and I feel like I'm out of place. I walk in the door and I'm looking at those kids and it's like they had answers to the questions and I don't know what book they're reading out of. And I have this, you know, that when Chuck drew that picture that he put in a, uh, when he put in a, a new pair of glasses, that circle and the stick man, that idea of separation, you know, which, which I don't know where we get that from. I mean, it's really impossible to be separate from each other. I mean, it's really poss- impossible to be separated from the power that we discover in alcoholics. Anonymous. But, you know, Larcene, our good friend, the Animal Family Groups out in California, says information floats through the universe, it lands on my head, and I begin to take action as if it's the truth. And I don't know where that comes from. But I walked in that door and I thought, man, I'm different from these kids. And I remember looking at them thinking, but I'm just different. And uh, you know how this story kind of plays out. It looks like, you know, after a bit, I begin to circulate around and I begin to notice things about these kids that I'm different from them. My clothes are different. You know, if I had their clothes and maybe I'd be happy. If I had that, maybe I'd be okay. If I had his brother and sister, you know, their family comes up in a nicer car. I think, man, if I had, if my family had a car like that, it would be okay. I'd be one of the cool kids. If I lived in that house they lived in, I might be one of those kids, cool kids too, you know. As we get older, as I go to high school, it's the same kind of stuff. If I was taller, you know, if I was more athletic, you know, if I dated that girl, if my mom and dad lived in a different place, if, if they were, if the circumstances were somehow different, somehow that would make me happy. The malady, I'm eating up with the malady and I don't have any idea. That's the propulsion. That's what pushes me along. Of course, when I get out in the real world, when I get a job and I'm out, I'm looking at other people. And of course, we're always comparing ourselves. I'm at least always comparing myself. What's the yardstick? If I had his job, you know, if I had his house, if I had his wife, his girlfriend, heck, if I could get them both in the same spot, maybe that would make me happy. You know, somehow or another, if I could get the picture out here right. I'd be happy. This idea of conscious separation, this idea that I'm different and somehow I've got to fix the picture out here to make it look right. And if I can get the picture out here to look right, somehow the information that I've operated on is if I can get the picture out here, all right, then I'll be okay in here. I'll achieve happiness. If I stack it up high enough out here, I'll be happy in here. And I think the world sells us on this idea. It's called advertising. They sell us on these ideas. If we have this, if you drink this, you'll be happy. You'll be better. You'll be different. And I think I started getting information like that as a, as a little kid and just growing up, you know, I'm plagued with this malady and separateness. Now, what I didn't know then, but what I absolutely know today is, that malady that I have, that malady that all of us 
or a lot of us have, that propel us here. It's driven by this idea that I'm separated from God on one thing and one thing only, self-will. What drives me and separates me from God is my own self-will. It's the absolute thing that separates me and creates in me this idea that I'm different, that I'm separated from any kind of power. Now, I don't think I have conscious thoughts about that. I just operate my life on self-will. When I operate my life on self-will, there's something really important is that I, I lack any kind of power to do anything. I'm headlong into the world without any clue about how this thing really works. Headlong into the world thinking whatever it is I have to achieve out here, I've got to get it on my own. And I don't know about you, but when I'm running out here on lack of power, what happens for a guy like me is I have to find ways to create false power. And maybe you all are familiar with some of these things. I call them just good management tools. I got to you people and you want to talk to them as if they were something bad like shortcomings and defects of character. I just thought they were good management tools. And, and they looked like they were in the form of lying and cheating and stealing, but that's just how you get through life. I mean, that's just how you power through. And it's pretty simple. You know, I lie to Devin and I get something over on him. I get a sense of power. That power is not sustainable. It's fleeting, but I lie to him. I get one over on him. I feel a sense of power. The trouble is it dissipates. It's not sustained. I cheat Jake out of something. I, I get one over on him. I go tell all the guys how I got one over on Jake, and I get a sense of power. It's not real power. It's not sustainable. It doesn't last, but I have a, I have a sense of power. Headlong through life. I steal something from Caroline, but I'm not that kind of bad friend. I at least help her look for it, you know, kind of play the game and look for it with her. But I get one over on her. I steal something from her. I get one over. I have the sense of power. And these management tools, these defects of character, these things that we look at in step six and seven, where willingness becomes a, a question, are we willing to do these things? These character defects that I begin to participate in and practice and hone in on as I'm running headlong through life, they give me the sense of some sort of power, but they're not sustainable, and I have to do something to create more power. The trouble is, in between that, what happens for a guy like me is when I lie to, when I lie to Deb and I get one over him, I have this sense of power, there's a flat line. There's that fleeting moment when that's gone. What happens when that's gone is I become restless, irritable, discontinued again. I cheat Jake out of something. I get the sense of power. I float along for a bit. It's not sustainable. It flat lines, and I become restless, irritable, and discontented again. I try to help Caroline look for that thing that she'd obviously lost, and I can't help. We can't find it. And, you know, of course, I've stolen it. And eventually, though, that flat lines, and I become restless, irritable, and discontent. When I was 11 years old, on a hot summer day here in Oklahoma, under a big old weeping willow tree, my brother opened up a can of country club malt liquor beer and he took a big drink and then he handed it to me. And I drank that beer with my brother underneath this big old weeping willow tree here in Oklahoma and the magic of alcohol happened for me. That restless cerebral discontentedness that uh, Bill described it in uh, step five and the 12 and 12 as anxious apartness, which I love that because it really identifies how that feels, anxious apartness. It just seemed to go away. And it's the illusion that alcohol creates. So we call it the magic of alcohol because that's really, it's a trick. Alcohol is elusive for a guy like me. It gives me this sense of ease and comfort, the sense of it. It doesn't give me real ease and comfort. It gives me the sense of ease and comfort. It's like lying, cheating, stealing, give me the sense of power. It doesn't give me real power. It doesn't plug me into anything. It's not sustainable. And every time I participate in defects of character, I get flatlined again. And I get restless, here with discontent. You know what happens to me? I think about that day that I had that drink with my brother 
consciously or unconsciously. And alcohol made all that okay. Alcohol absolutely made all that okay. Didn't know about the allergy of the body. It certainly didn't know about the obsession of the mind. But I certainly had all that. And I became that eventually daily drinker and then a blackout drinker and then, you know, burned my life to the ground. But what causes all that? How do I get from, you know, having a drink with my brother under a tree? How does that happen, that restless, irritable discontent, that separateness, the magic of alcohol that it creates, the illusion that I'm okay, the illusion that everything's all right, that that doesn't exist for me. It, it creates in itself this illusion. The book says that I'll be willing to chase to the gates of insanity or death. But I'm going to tell you something. Every time I drink, I'm willing to pay that price tomorrow to remove myself from the way I feel in that moment that I started drinking. And consciously or unconsciously, the decision has been made for me that once I began to drink when I was 11 years old, I was destined to follow this path. We look at that and we say, okay, how does that equate selfishness, self-centeredness? Bill Wilson in the 12 and 12 talked about King Baby. You know, when I was a little kid, I would I would be hungry. I would cry. Guess what they'd come do? They'd pick me up and feed me. I would get scared. I would cry. Guess what they would do? They would come to me and pick me up and comfort me. I would pee in my diaper. I'd cry. Guess what they would do? They would come change my diaper for me. It was a great day. Then they quit doing that. And that pissed me off, really. I mean, you know, I cry and they don't do anything. They give you they give you things like this that become old ideas for people like us. Be quiet or I'll give you something to cry about, right? Which translates to a guy like me is that men don't cry. And so we begin to stack up these old ideas from us that we gather up as kids and we we bring those into Alcoholics Anonymous too. But I began to do these things and they quit doing for me. And if you're separate, if you have restless, irritable discontentedness, that's a problem. That's a real problem. So you learn how to lie, cheat, and steal early on to get what you need to get by. It's just, it's just simple. And I do these things because I need to feel better. I'm going to tell you, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, if they would, if you would have said to me, Cliff, write out the top 100 problems in your life. I'm going to tell you guys something. I'm going to let you in a little secret. Selfishness and self-centeredness would not even have made the list. I mean, those aren't even on the radar screen because, you know, I'm a giver. You guys knew that. You know I'm a giver. Now, there's always a hook to the give, right? But I'm a giver. Selfishness, self-centeredness don't even make the screen, man. They're not even on my radar. Yet, when I get here, they lead the parade. When people want to start to talk about what's really wrong with me, they want to talk about selfishness and self-centeredness. And I've run through my life uh, headlong being selfish and self-centered. Some things I didn't know about myself that I absolutely knew today or that I know today. I'm a role assigner. When I meet you, I assign you a role in my life. I've been doing this since I was a little kid. I didn't know this until I came here and did some inventory. But I'm a role assigner. I've done that with my family. I've done that with my friends. I've done that at work, and I've done it with my romantic relationships. And the most evidence of all that is in my romantic relationship because it's the most vivid. It's the place where you can look at that and say, I get it. I see that. So my friend Caroline, she's always good to play with me this way. So Caroline's my girl tonight. And so what happens is, is that I meet Caroline and, and uh, within the first 15 seconds of meeting Caroline, I've assigned her a role. And I, in my head, I create the scenario that we are now married. We've got 2.5 kids. We got a house and a white picket fence and I've assigned her a role. And you know how this plays out. So Caroline are hot and heavy for the first 35, 45 days. We eventually have to come up for air though. So, and we begin to circle out in the world. Well, see, I know Caroline and so it's okay. So we begin to circle around in the world and there's some things I begin to notice about her. 
the first thing I notice about her is that when we're out in the crowd, she doesn't stand as close to me as the role calls for. Now, I have an entire script in my head of how everybody is supposed to act because I've assigned all of you roles in my life. Every one of you, when I meet you, you get a role. Now, I don't tell you what the role is. That would be highly unfair. And I have it scripted out of my head how this is supposed to play out, how every event is supposed to play out. And when Caroline and I go out, I notice she doesn't stand as close to me as the script calls for, particularly when we're in public. I also noticed that when she and I are out and we're around some other guys, she doesn't take my hand as quickly as the role calls for. And so what I do, because I believe she has star power, what I do is, is I begin to give her some hints because I'm helpful that way. I'm kind to her. I try to be really nice and sweet to her because I need her to move to the part. To, I need to move to the X where the role has her moving to. And I'll be really nice to her and I'll try to get her to move where I need her to move or take my hand quicker to, I'll get her, try to give her some subtle hints to bring her into the fold for her starring role. And if she can't catch it on when I'm really kind to her, what I'll be is just a total jerk to her. And I will browbeat her until she wants peace at any price. And she'll be willing to move to that spot because she doesn't want to incur my wrath anymore. And after like 90 days, 120, I began to realize that Caroline doesn't have the star power that I really thought she had. That She doesn't fit the role that I created for her. I mean, it's, she's not really fulfilling it. And I don't know what you all do when you have a major production like this, but you always want to be sure you got a couple of understudies just in case the star can't make it, right? So I go get a couple of understudies and I'm working with them, trying to build up their star power. Eventually, Caroline finds out about this. She's none too happy about it, by the way. And so what she does is she just leaves and she's mad and she leaves as she should. But in my head, what happens to me is I begin to think, good riddance. She didn't get it anyway. She didn't understand the role she was supposed to play for me. And we justify that, or at least I can justify that. I won't call it out right that it's the role she was assigned because I don't know that's what I'm doing. I'm clueless about that. I just know that she didn't understand and get me. And good riddance to her. And the moment I think good riddance to her, the, the thought creeps to me that is the death knell of every alcoholic. My God, I might be alone. My greatest fear, I'm going to be all alone. And I'm in this vicious loop with people. I'm selfish and self-centered. I assign you roles and I expect you to play that role. And when you do not, I am vastly disappointed in you. And what I do is with you is that I just write you off the Christmas list forever. I create scenarios in my head where you just don't get it. And I just, you know, write you out of my life. I've done that with friends, coworkers, employers, romantic relationships, family members. It just goes on and on and on. The book tells us that the real problem with a guy like me, when, when I'm this way, my willfulness that I want you to do the role that I've assigned you. I mean, this is, this is selfishness and self-centeredness at its apex. The book says my real trouble is I'm a victim. And see, I knew I was all my life. And the book bears this out. It says, however, I'm the victim of a delusion that I can somehow wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if I can just manage well. And see, I really believe that it's up to me. I've suffered from this delusion my whole life that if you people will follow the scripts as written in my head, if you'll follow those, I'll be happy. And there might be a side benefit where you might be somewhat happy. I really don't care though whether you are or you're not. But I'll be happy. 
And after all, that's what I'm shooting for. Now, the book calls that something else. It says we're like an actor who wants to run the whole show. But it's in essence, that's what I've described for you. And I've been doing that to people my whole life. I sign them roles and they disappoint me. And what happens is I get restless, irritable, discontented again when all that occurs. When you don't fulfill your role, and what happens? I drink. Because that's what you do. You like power. I'm separate from any kind of power. I like power. I become restless, irritable, discontent. I recall the sense of ease and comfort that alcohol gives me, and I drink. This is what this is what willfulness looks like. I just want to do what I want to do. Best scene when we first come to AA, and somebody says, "You know, you say I need help," and they say something like this to you. Okay, call me every day. And when I hear that, the first thing I think, "Well, that's stupid. I'm not going to do that." See, that's willfulness. <laughs> that's stupid. I'm not going to do that. Now I'm dying. Let's be clear about this. What does that look like when we wash ashore here? You know, when we wash ashore in Alcoholics Anonymous, it looks something like this. We're in the ocean and we're on Bob about two and a half and a Coast Guard cutter comes along, whips up beside us, sees us on Bob two and a half, Puts a, puts a rope around a blue life preserver and hurls it to us so we can grab it and they pull us in. And I'm in the water on Bob two and a half and I see the life preserver coming. I grab it, but I look at it and I notice that it's blue. And I look at that for a second time and I just throw it back. And I said, no, I only accept orange life preservers. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to accept what you are having to offer me. I mean, that's what it looks like. This is what willfulness looks like washing on the shores of Alcoholics Anonymous. You have, I've got a problem I can't solve, and you're offering a solution that I do not want. And that's willfulness. I don't know. I can't, no, I can't drink, and I can't not drink, and I'm here, and I don't know. The book tells us that the first thing I've got, the first requirement for a guy like me, is I've got to be convinced that any life run on self-will, which is what I've been doing, can never be a success. Now, circumstances have to somehow propel us to do that. And the book is riddled with little allegories and stories about circumstances. You know, if you read the chapter, We Agnostics, at the end of that, it talks about the man, uh, I think it was our Southern friend in, in their first edition, but it, he, he talks about that. He said, you know, if there is a God, he's never done anything for me. And then later that night, you know, he's in an asylum. And later that night, he thinks, who am I to say there's no God? And he said he felt this great loneliness, this separate, this cavern. And he said he tumbled out of bed to his knees. And the thought was, who am I to say there's no God? Circumstances. Circumstances are what help transition us from willfulness to willingness. And for, for a guy like me, what the circumstances have to be, it's spelled out exactly in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It says in there that I have to be beat, very descriptive, I have to be beat into a state of reasonableness. I love the next line in our book that follows that. It says, for some of us, this was a tedious process. That means I had to take a lot of butt whippings to get here, right? I had to take a, I had to take a lot to fully understand that, my God, maybe I do like blue life preservers after all. I mean, heck, why not, right? But I've got to somehow be beaten into this state of reasonableness where I've become willing. Because in and of myself, the book tells me the very nature of my problem is selfishness, self-centeredness. This is the root of the problem. As a matter of fact, it says we're the extreme example of self-will run right. And the book gives us many descriptions that tells us we're kind of the far part of anything like that. I've got a good friend that says, you know, we all go through teenage angst, and I don't disagree with that. Everybody here went through some form of teenage angst where we feel that difference. I just believe we feel it more intensely 
the, the beliefs that we have that we're really different are intensified when we make those, when we're in those wonder years, you know, in those teenage years, they're more intensified for us. What makes me believe that? Our book, the extreme example of self-will run right. More than most, the alcoholic leads a double life. We're, we're just, we're more intense. We're more about everything. I remember one year we were at a, one of the clubhouses here in Oklahoma City, they, at Christmas time, they had their anniversary, their clubhouse anniversary. And, and the, uh, the Alan Law speaker was on Friday night at their anniversary deal. And she got there. Man, they had the Christmas tree loaded with Christmas lights, man. And she looked over at that Christmas tree. She said, man, I can tell alcoholics dread decorate this tree just more, 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 you know. And that's me. Just more, more, more. It's never enough. It's, I want the extreme of everything. I have this idea that if I'm not living on the edge, I'm taking up too much space. I just need it to be that kind of way. And when it talks about that, the problem, selfishness, self-centered, this is the root of our problem. You know, some people criticize the language and how the book is written, but I think it's beautifully written. And I think it is exceptionally descriptive. When it talks about it's the root of our problem, when I hear that, the first thing I think about are those big redwood trees out in California. You guys know you've either seen them or you've seen pictures of them. There are some of them that are so big that they've carved a part out of them, put a two-lane road through them. You can drive two cars through, and there's still plenty of room to anchor that big tree there. And, man, they go way high. And I think about that tree, and I think, man, it's so high up. It must have a really, really big root system that goes way down to hold itself, to anchor itself, that hell, they cut a hole in it, and it still stands up. And that's what selfishness and self-centered looks like in me. It is anchored in me. It is the root. It goes way down deep, and it's anchored in me. It is anchored in me to be willful to hold on to my own will, to hang on to my good ideas, to hang on to my, what I believe is the best. You know, that's all running me out of fear. The book talks about fear being this evil and corroding thread shot through the fabric of my life. A lot of the decisions I make based on self are made out of fear. I'm afraid of what you'll think of me. So I'll lose my reputation with you as slim as that might be. And so I operate in this deep root system inside of me of selfishness and self-centeredness. And it tells us in that in all those pages on page 62, it talks to us in there about that we got to be rid of selfishness or it kills us. Being selfish and running on self-will, willfulness will kill a guy like me. Because I'll keep running headlong into life without any power. I'll continue to be restless, irritable, discontent. I will continue to seek the sense of ease and comfort. And the book is very clear for me to drink is to die. So this is going to kill me. Yeah, the drinking is going to eventually get it, but it's going to be actions based on self. It's going to be my own self-will, my own decision, thinking my own thinking is the it is the apex of everything that circulates. That is the alpha and the omega, as it says in the chapter we have. We're the beginning and the end of everything. Cliff, beginning and end of everything. And the book says that we got to be rid of that or it kills us. And then it says the most remarkable thing in there. It says we have to have God's help. It's impossible to do this of our own. Don't you love going to step six meetings? You ever go to step six or seven meetings? And somebody in there, they ask some, they call on somebody or they volunteer. And they want to talk about their defects of character. And they say the most strange thing to me. I'm working on my defects. Well, I love it when they say they're working on their sex defect. Because I think, you bet you are, you horny bastard. You're working on your sex defect. You know? I mean, I want you to think about that for a minute. What power, what power do I have to do anything? What power do I have to cause any of that to be removed? What power do I have? No human power could relieve my alcoholism. 
what power do I possibly think I now possess that allows me to believe that I can have some kind of influence over my defense? Self-will. I'm back in self again. When I'm telling you I'm working on my defects, I'm just telling you I'm throwing more, more problem at the problem. The book's very clear. I got to find these things that says objectionable. If I don't find them objectionable, I'll just keep doing it. We like to say all the time, but that's just old behavior. I got news for you. If you're still doing it, it ain't old behavior. It's, it's current behavior, right? It ain't old. I'm still doing it. Circumstances. Beaten into a state of reasonableness. When our scorecards read zero, I mean, the book over and over tells us what does the transformation look like for a guy? I mean, how do I move from willfulness to willingness? How do I move over from this idea that I'm powerless over alcohol, my life is unmanageable. How do I move from that spot? Because really that's the first willingness we get into. Faced with a, which a, a crisis that I can't postpone or evade, looking at that, you know, when the facts are in, the book says we learned we had to fully concede to our innermost self. How do we do that? We look at our life. And we're usually in a jackpot when we get here. I mean, I don't know, but I didn't get here thinking, gosh, my life's really good. I wonder if I went to AA, that might just help me tweak it just a little bit. I mean, I'm in a mess when I get here. I'm not coming here for you know, relationship advice and stuff. I'm coming here because my hair's on fire. I mean, I don't want to have hair, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm here trying to figure that out. And there's these circumstances that propel us into a moment of clarity, what the book talks about it. We describe that moment in a lot of different ways. The book talks about it, uh, incomprehensible demoralization. We'll talk about it in the rooms as something like the gift of desperation. I'm going to tell you what it is. It's a moment of grace. That's all it is. Sweet. I put myself in a position to be harmed once more that I don't have any way out of. I have finally got myself in a rat trap that I got no answers for. I've finally been beaten into a state of reasonableness. And those circumstances can look so much different for all of us. You know, for some people, those circumstances to move from willfulness to willingness, they have to be in a blackout drunk and kill a family of four and go to prison for life to finally say, oh, my God, that's me. There are some people who will bounce a check at the country club and go, oh, my God, that's me. It doesn't matter. And none of that matters. It, whatever the circumstances are that propel you to the moment of clarity, to receive a moment of grace, to move you from this position of selfishness, self-centeredness, this moment of willfulness to transform to suddenly as, oh, my God, this is me. To where the next answer is, call me every day is, that sounds stupid, but I'm going to do it. That's willingness. We all agree that sounds stupid, but I'm going to do it. Because I'm out of plans and ideas. If I had one more plan, one more idea, the day I washed up on the shore of Alcoholics Anonymous, the day I got here, the day that an old man carried a beneficial message to me where I had a moment of grace, where I could see and I could hear, all the tumblers fell into place for me. They all lined up and I could see as clear as a bell. My God, it is me. I am alcoholic. This is me. And I had to be willing, the book said, concede that to myself. It's the very first spot we get to willingness here, step one. And every step that we have here has a degree of willingness behind it, right? Every step here, there has to be a degree of willingness you know, I have to be, the book says, when a man's even willing to believe, you know, came to believe, he said, if you're willing to believe, I just say, listen, if you're a little bit suspicious, <laughs> if you can just be suspicious, there's not be something else out there. Hope's what we're dealing here. Hope's what we're looking for. But willingness plays a part. I got to be willing just to consider the, mo the idea. And in step three, it talks about willingness is the key for me to be willing to turn my will and my life over. I've got that takes some, that's a big jump. It's a big jump for a person who's run their life, their whole life. Now suddenly we're asking, Hey, willingness is the key. Sometimes it's incremental. I remember they used to say things, man, you're throwing in town one string at a time. And sometimes it feels that way on willingness. Sometimes I want to hang on as long as I tell people, man, hang on just as long as you can stand it. <laughs> Don't do that four step just as long as you can stand it, man. 
You know, I need relief. I'm here powerless. I need to get connected to the power. What's the quickest route? The steps. And the steps are the juice. This, we don't deal in magic here. That was booze. Booze performed magic on me. It created an illusion that I was okay. What we deal in here is miracles. Don't make any mistake about it. The book bears that out. There's a wholesale miracles taking place, it says. As a matter of fact, it says our own recoveries tell us that. There's 7 billion people in the world. People tell us that there are 10% of the population are alcoholic. That's 700 million people alcoholic. Alcoholics Anonymous claims a membership of 2 million. There's a better chance of me getting struck by lightning tonight than being sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. Yet here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Miracles. We're not in the magic business. People, I hear some... They say goofy things sometimes. I don't criticize them. I just, we're not, there's no magic here. There's miracles. For a person to come here selfish and self-centered and to suddenly be transformed of what can I do for you? How do I help these people? How do I, that is a miracle. That is what the book described as a reversal in thinking. And what happens for a guy like me is when I get here and I have that because I've been, my whole life I'm anxious and afraid. I mean, my whole life. I'm anxious and afraid. And suddenly I get here and you you all offer me these things. I find that I have to become willing because circumstances have made me that way. Circumstances have driven me that way because I'm out of plans and ideas. I got nothing left. And what happens is the most beautiful thing when I become willing to, when I get willingness in my life, I begin to have this transformation, but more importantly, I begin to have this collaboration with the God of my understanding. You know, it's not like we get here and uh, 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 we have any, we don't sprinkle anybody or anything like that. This is a process. You know, the first day I got here, the old man looked at me and he said, do you hope what's working for me can work for you? Simple. I just said, yes. He said, we're moving on to step three. Sometimes I think about when we talk about the steps in Alcoholics Anonymous, they seem so linear, don't they? We do this, and then we do this, and then we do this. And the truth of the matter is that I'm somewhere 60, 90 days. I'm working on a fourth step, and suddenly the tumblers all click about what they were talking about in step two. And I begin to see the evidence of this God in my life. I I begin to see the evidence of the of the power working in my life. I don't have to understand that. I don't have to understand how God works. As a matter of fact, the book says we won't be able to comprehend or define that. So I don't even need to try. This is the good part. This is good news for a guy like me. I don't have to understand that. I don't have to try to sit down and pencil it out for anybody. And nor does anybody have to pencil it out for me. It's like walking to a dark room. I mean, when I, the very first time I went to a dark room as a kid, what happened was I was with my mom or dad or grandmother or someone, somebody, and they reached over and they hit a switch and the light came on. You know what I did when I saw that? I came to believe that if I hit the switch, it would work for me too. I didn't have to understand uh, how where electricity came from. I mean, I didn't have to describe for them at, at two or three or four years old where electricity came from. You know, I didn't know it was a bunch of water running over a dam or it was a couple of squirrels out here with some uranium on a, on a deal pushing it in the house. I mean, I don't have to know any of that. You know, what I have to know is I need to know where the switch is. That's the key here. Where's the switch? And the switch for a guy like me is in the steps, and I got to get willing to do that. I've got will. I've got to become willing to be engaged in the steps, and enter into this collaboration with the power that I found here. Because when we have the courage to collaborate with God, when we get to that point where we're willing to collaborate with God and align ourselves, as the book says, this is the proper use of the will. When we align our will with God's will. And when we enter this collaborative process for with him, 
it lights a fire inside of us. There's something that happens to us. We talk about this all the time. We see new people come in and we say the same thing every time. Man, their eyes just lit up. And that's what happens. They experience God. And if we have to describe God in any way, I would say it's an experience. We experience that in some way. Just like Alcoholics Anonymous is experiential for us. We begin to experience willingness in step one and we and we continue to surrender that willfulness into willingness on every step we take based upon our experience in the prior step. I survived that, I'll do step three. I survived that, I'll write a four step. I survived that, I'll tell somebody. I survived that, I'll look at the defects. I survived that, I'll ask God if he'll help me. And we're on and on and on. And what happens for us, we begin, we begin to get in tune with the music of Alcoholics Anonymous. To be able to describe it as the language of the heart. You know, one alcoholic talking to another. And suddenly we, we transcend that spot of selfishness, self-centeredness. And it becomes exactly what the book talks about. We, be, we begin to get joy out of being a service to other people, not just alcoholics. Of course, that's what, of course, helps us. We have to do that. But what we really get as we begin to move along is we learn that there's there's beauty and joy in, in, in helping just other people. There's beauty and joy in just going to the supermarket and looking for the strays, you know, the stray buggies and trying to corral them back. Because I know when I go do that, see, there's some little person inside that's got to go gather all those up in the wintertime, all those wild shopping carts that mosey out to the far reaches of the pasture, the parking drive, right? And if I can go do those, if I can gather those up because I've been that guy my whole life, it doesn't matter, just push the shopping cart out the way. See, I've been that guy. That's some that's somebody's job to go get that. It's not my job to put it in the corral. It's those people's job to go get it. So I'm really keeping them employed by pushing this all the way out to where it's almost in the street. I'm really helping people. No, no. My job today is when I go to the supermarket, I look for strays and I go gather them. Why? Because that's who I used to be. And today what I want to be is service to that man or woman who in the cold has to come out and do that on their own. It's a miracle, really. It's a real miracle of how we transcend from willfulness to willingness. How the simplest, kindest acts today will go out of our way for complete strangers to perform some act of kindness. Not because suddenly we have this bolt of lightning or we want somebody to see and we want recognition. You know, we'll do things in Alcoholics Anonymous secretly. We'll do things and not want anybody to catch us. And that's why it should be. This great humility we get, you know, to suppress the ego the ego's desire for self and recognition, you know, every day I remember they used to say when I first got here, Cliff, you need to do something good for somebody today and don't get found out. I'm like, what's the point of that? You know, I take the trash out and want recognition every Sunday night. I mean, I can't help myself. I need to tell my wife, my God, I've taken the trash out again. One time she looked at me and said, you know, Cliff, I've been doing the laundry and dishes around here for 20 years. And I never say anything to you about that. And my immediate response was, well, you should. You should say something. Because then they, then I would feel better about telling you about the trash. You know? But we do these things today. We do them for complete strangers. We do them, why? For fun and for free. One more thing I'm going to shut up. We come here restless, irritable, discontent. In our book, in the chapter, it talks about towards the back, one of the lost chapters. It talks about, for we are sure God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. It's the only place where it really tells us what God wants for us. And to move here, to move from a spot of restless, irritable discontentedness to a spot where you're happy, joyous, and free, I want you to think about that for just a minute of what kind of transformation that takes. That's no magic. There's no voodoo in that. That's a miracle. And that's a miracle. That's, some, that's, a, that's a rabbit trick I can't do. 
That's a, I come here so selfish and self-centered. I can't move restless, irritable discontent to happy, joyous, and free. And the secret, the secret to all that happy, joyous, and free is to give it all away to you. It's the craziest thing. It's one of the biggest riddles in AA, right? In order to keep it, I got to keep giving it away to you. I'm so grateful for you all tonight. Thank you for allowing me to come and share. Thank you. And thanks so much, Cliff. That was awesome. Um, so yeah, for those of you who might have missed the format in the beginning, uh, we're going to have about 30 minutes left here where we can do a Q&A. If you wish to uh, ask a question and participate, uh, you can just raise your hand in Zoom. If I think that's under reactions, and there's raise your hand. And uh, and then, yeah, Cliff, if you want to call on them, or I can call on them, and I'll, uh, I'll unmute you guys. I'll leave it to you, man. All right, and just, you know, be mindful. We have a half hour, and if we can try to get to everybody, we can. That's great, but we may not be able to get to everybody. But I'll turn it over to you guys. What's up, guys? Uh, can you hear me? Cool. Jake, alcoholic addict. Um, Cliff, great to hear you, brother. I don't really got a question. I don't, uh, it's the first time um, doing a question and answer thing. Uh, but, it was, man, it was great to hear you. got me fired up. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of it rang true. I don't really have any questions. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm grateful to be sober. I got put onto this mean by a good friend, you know, Got a lot of sobriety. We all just got one day, but I, I, I respect the sobriety. I uh, look up to it, and uh, you know, and that's the beauty of Zoom for for me. You know, it's uh, you know, I love going to meetings. You know, and I went to one every day before they shut down. So, you know, now I can just do three, four a day if I got the time. You know, and uh, that's awesome. And uh, so, with that, I'll uh, you know, I'll pass it on. But I just wanted to say thanks for your share, and it's good to be here. Thanks, Jake. We're glad you're here, man. And for that matter, if other people just have something they'd like to share, mm -hmm. by all means. Yeah, hi, my name is Toby and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, thank you so much, Cliff, for being here tonight. It was really great to hear you. Um, hope I can hear you again sometime. Uh, my question is, uh, I've been kind of falling off on my program. I don't feel like I'm going to drink, but today, you know, I yelled at my kids. I sent them to their room and stuff like that for things that really, you know, they were bugging me. And, uh, you know, they're three and six years old, nearly four years old and six. And uh, I should be able to just, you know, kind of smile and allow God to speak through them uh, and, and tell me about my own character defects. Instead, I'm getting insulted and I'm getting, uh, you know, just real antsy. And so, uh, you know, my program's been slipping. I haven't been keeping up with the uh, nightly review. Uh, I pray, but not as much as I should. Uh, so I guess my question would be, what's the best way to get back into it uh, for somebody who's taken a little bit of time off? Thank you. Yeah, man. Thank you. And so uh, I really don't have a lot of say about that, but it's going to take me a long time to say it. So bear with me. Um, uh I have this profound belief that when we get in spots like that, and I've been there. So uh, the first question I have to ask is, so I'm feeling spiritually out of sync. So the first question I have to look is, okay, in my relationship with God, who moved? Who moved? And then the question I have to ask myself is, who needs to move back? And what the answer I've always come to in that is it's always me that moves. God never leaves. He's never very far away. And so one of the things that my experience here is, is that Alcoholics Anonymous is kind of like uh, walking up a down escalator. We talk about a trudge here. We walk with a purpose. And I want you to think about walking up a down escalator. As long as you're walking, if you're making a step, you're making progress, you're beating the down of the escalator, you're making incremental progress, but you're moving. And the very second you stop, what happens is you start on your way back down. And everything you describe is a, is, is, is somebody who's walking up an escalator and stopped. Because you said all the things that we always say, I don't think I'm going to drink. 
I don't feel like I'm going to do that, but I'm yelling at my kids, you know? So, you know, I always say, you know, if I go to my AA group and I'm like the Dalai Lama at the coffee bar, I mean, I'm just, I'm a spouse and platitudes. I mean, some people would think, gosh, he's near water walker status. He's just so holy, you know? And then I get in my car and I come home and the dogs run out, run to the next room and my wife slams the door and the kids go in the room. My program's BS. It's not working at home. It's it's really BS. And I'm not pointing my finger at you, but I'm just giving you something to think about. We talk about here, you know, we're striving for spiritual progress. All of us, without exception, you can't stay on the straight and narrow. It's just because we're human. Because we reach back and take our self-will back. And then circumstances here gets in us, get us in yet another jackpot. And it may be I, I just yell at the kids or whatever, and I think, I don't want to be that way. I'm, I'm back being that guy again. Circumstances make us once again realize, gosh, I've, I've done it again. And then the moment we realize that, it's the key. You know, there's some things that have to happen for us here. One is we have to get awake. I'm a so I'm dead asleep when I'm dead asleep on arrival in AA. Through the process of the steps, I begin to come awake. Once I'm awake, then I can have awareness, which is what you just described. And so long as I'm having awareness, then I can do something about it. The bad part is, is if you get here, come awake, become aware, and then slowly go back to sleep in AA and aren't aware of it at all, because that's a lock that you'll drink again. I mean, that's a guarantee almost. You come here and go back to sleep, you'll take your will back in three, you know, and uh, uh, you'll you'll go insane again in two and you'll drink again. So, and I've watched too many people do that. And anybody, the folks that are here that have been here any appreciable time can give you example after example of people that walked into AA, woke up, got on fire about the steps, went back to sleep, walked right out the door and got drunk. So the, the fact that you're aware is indicated that you're still awake. And so what you do is you do what you did the first day you got here. You plant a flag and say, this is day one of my emotional sobriety. I'm back on the beam. I've shared it. They know about it. I'm not hiding it. I'm, I'm, I'm back rolling again. And just start tonight with that review, man. That's all you can start right where you are. Hope that helps. Awesome. Uh, next, I see Emily. Still muted. I'll try one more time. There we go. Uh, is that good? Yep. <clears throat> okay. So um, I really enjoyed this tonight. It's the first meeting like this I've been to. Um, I'm almost 90 days sober, and I am um, experiencing a lot of different things, as you might imagine. I fell in love with AA. I'm just now beginning to work my steps with my sponsor, which she and I are doing really well with. Um, but I just want to talk about what happened this weekend because I feel like the more people that I share things with, I feel like that's going to give me strength. I think that there's strength in the more people that you hang out with and they know how you feel, where you're at, what you're doing with your life and that they can really make a difference for you or they can make a difference against you. Um, I, I went, we own a lake house out at, uh, out in Bowie and we went to the lake house, which I relate everything at the lake house with drinking. I mean, that's, that's what you do at the lake. Right. And this weekend is the first time I went out there and I was around, I went to a happy hour where they're drinking beer and eating pizza. And we, you know, I just told them all they needed to start investing in the diet, Dr. Pepper, and just kind of left it at that. Then they were all curious about, uh, you know, where I'd been and what I'd been doing. And I just started telling them and talking to them. And honestly, when I left there, I felt more powerful and more sh and stronger in not drinking probably in the whole 80 days that I've been sober. And my husband is a hundred percent support. And I'm just, you know, he drank a few beers and ate pizza and I ate pizza and 
drank a couple of dark a couple of Dr. Peppers. <laughs> but y'all, it's just I'm just thankful and I'm thankful to be here and to be listening to all of y'all. And I hope that I, I want to I want to draw my strength from people that have been sober much longer than I have. That's where I have to do it. That and sharing my story with people that drink. You know, let me tell you about what I've been through. And they all laughed at me when I all la- and I laughed at all of them and it was fun. It was good. So that's really all I have. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks. Next up I see John S. Hello everybody. I'm an alcoholic. My name's John. It's all God's grace mercy and sitting here sober today. Hey, Cliff, I, I've always wanted to ask you this when it came to six and seven. And uh, where you say, you know, it's all God's, you know what I mean? And because uh, my sponsor points out, like, you know, in the, in the step book, it says, uh, you know, and nowhere does he render us quite as snow, white as snow without our cooperation. Like, I have to do something, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, like, I, like say I cost less or whatever, you know what I mean? And, uh, like, I, like, I have a role in that. And it, the second part is with the shortcomings, he says it's a negligence of responsibilities. Like, I'm not doing the right thing. You know what I mean? Like, there's something I have to do, like make meetings, work the steps and stuff like that. I didn't know what your take was on that. But, uh, like, like I have a responsibility in them steps where, like, a lot of people say it's all God. Just, you know, I just want to throw that out. Not well, to debate it. No, no, no. I, I get it. And I think it's really pretty clear because, you know, we when, when, I, when I first went to the steps and I arrived at the book on six and seven, I mean, the first 100 spent, like, if you count the doctor's opinion, they spend like 50 something pages on step one. And then they spend like 15 or 16 pages on step two. They spend four or five pages or three or four pages on step three, step four and five get, you know, uh, all these pages. And then you come to six and seven and you get two paragraphs. And I'm thinking, my God, it's the free space on the bingo card. I mean, how big a deal can this be? <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, but really, if you read the language of the book on step six, it says when we arrive at this point, we have to find these things objectionable. And we come through the step process, looking at our lives, looking at these actions we've done based on self and so we have to make some decisions am i willing because that's what the steps calls for i have to be willing to find these objectionable and so when i ask god to remove those what happens if if i'm a liar and i say you know god help me from not lying now what my part is to go out and try to act like a guy that lying's been removed from him I've got to start telling, I've got to be invested in the opposite of lying. I got to be invested in the truth. If I'm a thief, I've got to be invested in not stealing. My part is to become invested in the collaboration with God that, hey, I'm willing to start acting like a guy that don't steal. I'm willing to start collaborating like a guy that don't lie. And what happens is in my experience on this, when I get, when I become willing, when I get beat down, because that's what it always takes for me. Every defect since I got sober that I've been willing to, to, to find objectionable, there's been claw marks going down the wall until I get in two things have to happen. One, I get in sufficient pain or, or worse yet, I begin to see the pain in the eyes of the people I love the most that my defects are hurting them. And I thank God it's once again, I'm doing it again. I am doing it again. And I begin to find these things objectionable because the truth of the matter is, and people say, well, we need the 12 and 12 because, you know, but if you really look at everything up to six and seven, all the work is there. Everything is there for us. All the work's laid out for us to when we get to the, when we arrive at six, you, you got to look, you know, my wife says it best when she tells her story. She says, when I did my fifth step, I was both relieved and horrified that I've been this way. And I think we arrive at a spot, or I, I'm hopeful that we arrive at a spot that we're both, I'm grateful that I'm happy that I get this out, but my God, I can't believe how petty I am. My God, I can't believe that I do these things. Please help me. 
and we become willing to find these same objections. I think that there's this collaboration with God in six and seven. We find them objectionable, we ask for help, and then I think the strangest thing starts to happen for us. God starts putting new people in our life. And while we're over here helping new people, God removes these things from us. He keeps us busy. Because if I'm not busy, well, I'll start blocking him off. I'll start engaging in activities that keep me lying all the time. But if I'm over here busy helping Jeff, and he and I were going to the book and the steps, you know, and then I'm helping Don Marie's calling me, and she and I are working on a conference or something together, and we're doing, I'm busy in AA. I look up one day, and I haven't told a lie in six months. Because I've been over here doing God's work, and just like it's promised in step three, he'll meet all my needs if I stay close to him and perform his works well, right? I just think it's the collaboration we have with him. Hope that answered that. Or at least that's my spin on it anyway. Awesome. Great question. Uh, next up, I see Barbara. Hi, guys. I'm Barbara Lee. I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. And thanks so much for your lead. It was awesome. So I have a little bit of time, a few 24s. And I recently just went through the steps with somebody new. I don't know, maybe this is the seventh or eighth time I take many people through the steps often. This is somebody I met on a Zoom meeting, and I really lo love what she had. And, and I just uh, I actually flew down. I'm from New York. I flew down to Florida to do this step in person. And I didn't realize like my whole world cracked open again. Like I got to tell you, I came home and my relationships with like, like people that are so close to me, just, just, just change. And I, and I realized how I was, my number one character defect was judgment. You know, um, you know, I had three of them that I walked away with after doing six and seven sitting for an hour. But the, the question I have for you is like, after being around for so long and really thinking I was living a, you know, a free life, I, I was just so bound in judging others and thinking that, you know, they just couldn't show up for me. So I just needed to move on and find people that could show up for me. But just the fact that I thought that they weren't showing up for me was just a crock of shit. Um, it says here on the A step, and I'm on the A step right now, I sat for an hour and she wanted me to write down a list of people I harmed. Forget about forget about my resentments. Forget about she just wanted me to sit down and, and, and meditate for an hour on, on the people I harmed. And the question I have for you here is uh, any experience you have going through the steps uh, in step eight. And, and it says we make we make our first approach. So she talked about making many approaches because I've made amends with so many people. And I've hurt so many people in my life. My I have three little children. I have, you know, I could sit down and think of a lot of people in sobriety now having this new set of glasses, even just from this gift of doing this new fifth step that I continue to hurt. Now, is it real bad? No, my ego can say it's bad or good, whatever the case may be. But I guess my question to you is, is uh, making amends in sobriety. Um, Cause I do, I do, a, I, I try to do a 10 step and 11 step. I try to make amends immediately as I, as I go through my day, you know, or in the evening or the, you know, when I do something wrong, if I feel like somebody was just talking about yelling about at their kids, like I do that and I'll, and I'll, and I'll come to that. But uh, I just don't want to, I just don't want to, you know, say something and not live accordingly to it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to make any big proclamations and, and say, oh, man, I really, my eyes were closed. Uh, obviously, I, this has to go through prayer and meditation some more. I'm only on the A step again. But I guess I just wanted your take on my position. Uh, if you could add anything to where I'm at um, and, you know, to maybe help enhance my process as I continue on. Um, yeah. Thanks, Cliff. Okay. Well. Um, I, I've been in a spot where I've been real judgmental of other people. I call that being over sober. Uh, 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 you know, just, just before you ascend the water walker status, you know, you get over sober and they're not doing it right. And, uh, uh, that's a scary spot to be in, to be honest with you, because I'm, I'm back in the God chair, which is step three stuff. So, you know, that's not an eight-step problem. This is a two-three problem. And and the big, uh, just my experience is, is that when I'm out, you know, when I quit sharing my experience and I begin telling you what to do, I have elevated myself back to God's status again. Because anytime 
I'm placing judgment on you. I'm way past experience. I'm saying I know better. And to say I know better, I mean, I don't even know what's good for my life. Dr. Paul said this, I don't even know what's good for my life. How do I know what's good for you? I've elevated myself back to God's status again. And 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 the, what has to happen, what happened to me was not very flattering experience, but I'll share it if it helps. At about nine years sober, Caroline's heard this before. I got over sober. I mean, I did just what I said. I quit. I was sponsoring a whole bunch of guys. I thought I was somebody in AA, which is really a crazy thing to think of. You know, I, I want to be a big shot in an anonymous program. It's scary, really. And uh, 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 I came home one day and my wife, we, I'm nine years sober and we've been together for 15 years or so at that spot. She sat me down and she said, I don't know you. You're sober physically, but you're not spiritually sober. You're not mentally sober and you got to go. And I want you to pack your bag tonight because I'm having a sober home and I'm not living in this house with somebody as crazy as you are. Cause I was, I was insane again. I was back in the God chair. And at nine years sober, chair in our area conference, alternate area chair, I got thrown out of my house. This is called ego deflation at depth. <laughs> These are circumstances make you willing to believe, right? And I remember that day when I met, I didn't argue with her because I, I've learned not to argue with people here. I remember when I left that day and I said, I'm going to spot my sponsor. And maybe you've had this experience that have you ever said something to your sponsor? And as the last syllable crossed your lips, you think, my God, let me get that back. That's just, maybe he won't hear that right. You know? And what I said to him was, and I hope you never have to say this. I said, man, Don, I got to get back to basics as if there's an upper level here as if there's something else that we can do here, as if there's a level that we move beyond that we're kind of an upper tier AA. And what we have here is trust God, clean house, help others, period. There's nothing else. And, you know, in the chapter of the family afterwards, some of the unknown chapters, the mystery chapters, at the very end of that chapter has something that's so appropriate for me at that time. It says in the book, it says, we have three little sayings, three little apropos here, and it leads with the very first one, live and let live. It's none of my business. Everything about my business ends at the end of my nose. You know, when my guys, if I, they call me and, and I, and they want me to, they get, they offer, they want my experience. I give them a suggestion. They go outside, set their hair on fire. I, I can't help that. They came to me. I gave them the best experience I could. If they choose to do something else and it, and it ends up a disaster, hey, I don't take offense to that day. See, I used to get wrapped up thinking, my God, if you just listen to me, because everybody has to have their own spiritual path to God. I believe the worst thing we can do is to interfere with other people. The greatest sin may be interfering with somebody's spiritual path, getting between them and God, interfering with their walk their journey. And when I judge people or when I tell you this is what you should do, I'm doing just that. I don't know if that helps you or not. I don't know if that has any application or not, but I hope it resonates somewhat. Thanks so much. And it looks like our last question of the night is going to be Bob B. from Minden, Ontario. I'm going to let the Canadians talk. <laughs> Oh, you all think I have an accent, don't you? Hey, Hello, Bobby. <laughs> Good to see you, man. <laughs> I really have Bob an alcoholic. Yeah, I got interrupted there. I had my hand up and I was going to go next, and my son rolled in for five or ten minutes, and I had to come back. But Cliff, I really enjoyed talking to you. This, I really like what you said about the miracle thing. It, it when I first heard miracle floated around this program many years ago. I thought you guys are out of your mind. And then I hung around all these years and I watched people come and go and die and destroy their lives. And and I went, oh my heavens, like this is a miracle that I've been able to stay sober. And and you put the numbers out there 
And it's so true. Because a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people go, this isn't a miracle. This, well, hang around for a while, maybe, and just check it out. Because it is, you're going to find out. And you know, the miracle of this program is, I'm pretty sure everybody on here can agree on this. We're all tired of this COVID. <laughs> man, have, have I ever met a ton of great alcoholics in recovery on Zoom? Oh, my heavens. Like, here I am talking to a guy from Oklahoma City. You know, I found out about this meeting. I got a text about an hour before the meeting from a young lady by the name of Heather in Southern California who'd heard you talk, had heard your wife talk, apparently. And she says, hey, if you want to hear a real good talk, just jump on this meeting. I never heard of Heather in Southern California a year ago. I, I hang with, out with a group daily from Washington State. I don't know anybody in Washington State. I do now. Been hanging out there since March. Like, wow. It's just so uh, another little, I don't know if that's a miracle, but another little gift from God, in my in my opinion, that uh, here I get to, to meet all you people and share. God, I didn't even know you Americans even drank. I didn't. I thought it was a northern thing. <laughs> no, I I knew. <laughs> I've been to some meetings in, in Daytona. <laughs> no, I knew you did. I'm just kidding you. But I, I like to have fun with this program. But it, it is life and death, and it's uh, yeah, and really on. You're very you're so honest, Cliff. It's right from the heart, and you're honest. So thanks for that share. Thank you so much, Bobby. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.